Hello, welcome to this episode of the Martial Truth Training versus Teaching. This is a subject I've wanted to talk about for quite a while because um, it seems in martial arts we have a, a unique type of situation that develops. So you, ha you have someone that trains, whether it be in really any of the martial arts, and they um, make black belt. And they make black belt and they think, well, now I'm a black belt, uh, that means I'm a teacher. And, and a lot of dojo immediately start having students call that person sensei, um, which, you know, again, the word sensei really only means one who came before. So it's not wrong to call a person that. Um, you know, a lot of the Q grades in uh, my schools will call any of the black belt sensei because, again, it's just easy, right? It's easy to remember the one word sensei. I don't use senpai, you know, that's to me is... Yeah, I've never heard that term used in Japan. I've never heard a student in a dojo in Japan called senpai. All right, so I don't, I don't use it. Again, here in the States and in the West, we like to attach a lot more importance to these different words and titles and start using them in ways that um, they're not used in Japan or Okinawa. All right, so, uh, you know, just keep some of that in mind. So, my own experience. So, um... I started teaching children's classes as a brown belt. So that means I was around 17 years old. Um, I was supposed to help a black belt actually teach the children's classes at the YMCA where we taught Ishinru. And literally a month or so into it, uh, that black belt's mother got sick and he couldn't do the class anymore. So the chief instructor of the dojo comes to me and says, listen, you're the only guy with a schedule that can teach the kids' classes, but you're a brown belt. You really shouldn't be teaching them. And I'm thinking, yeah, I agree. Like, I shouldn't be teaching them. But if you don't do it, we've got to cancel a kids' class already. And I said, all right. So I, I decided to do it. Um, I was terrible. Terrible. Like... These kids, their basics had to be perfect before they'd get promoted. And, you know, I was, everything was like, you know, because I wanted everything to be done 100% right and 100% correct. I was way too strict. And amazingly, though, I, I had a lot of children's students, you know. So it wasn't like the program people were quitting. They were sticking it out. But again, you know, we're talking over 40 years ago. So, again, kids were a little different back then. They weren't the snowflakes we're dealing with now. The kids that, you know, need safe spaces, okay? Back then, these kids were still going outside and playing, okay? They were, you had very rarely did you have a case where a child was overweight. Um, and frankly, you know, like, not here in the Arizona school, but in New York school, we see a lot of where the kids come in and they're overweight. Um, and, you know, again, this is something that parents have to get a handle on. But again, so I was a bad teacher teaching the kids' classes. Um, you know, so finally, you know, I, I mentioned to the head guy, so, you know, I, I think some of these kids are ready. So he comes down and he watches and he promotes them. Um, before you know it, I'm like, I don't know what level brown belt I was at in EQ, EQ. You know, he gives me certificates, pre-signed certificates. And he says to me, you can promote up to this rank. Maybe it was green belt. I don't know. So he says, when you promote someone, you write it down, you give it to me, and you let me know so I can keep track of them. I said, okay. Um, then before you know it, I made Shodan. Um, you know, my teaching was improving, but not great. I mean, anybody that thinks they're instantly a great teacher um, is living in a world of unicorns um, and rainbows. All right? Nobody... Nobody is born a great teacher. It's something that requires a lot, a lot of work, all right? So I continue to teach the kids' classes. Um, you know, now I'm a shodan, so I'm teaching some of the adult classes too when, you know, I'm the senior person there and there's no other black belts there. Um, then I get an opportunity. I get hired as a director at the Asphalt Green Sports and Arts Center on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, which is still there to this day. Um, and the guy who was a, a director at the YMCA called me up and said, Hey, we'd like to hire you to teach art. 
And I was like, cool. And, and you'll be also be an assistant director. Okay, great. You know, I was just starting out. You know, what am I? I'm 18, 19 years old. Um, you know, so maybe a little older, maybe 20, whatever. But, you know, I said to him, I says, oh, um, I'd like, would it be possible for me to teach a karate class there? And he goes, oh, I didn't even think of that. You, you were teaching the karate classes at the YMCA. He says, yeah, why don't we do that? I says, yeah, well, we can do it two nights a week. So I started kids' classes and adult classes there two nights a week. A couple of my students from the YMCA would come in, the guys that were, you know, um, worker outers. I mean, that school, you had kind of two camps. You had the black belts that kind of talked about working out, and then you had the guys that actually worked out. So the guys that liked, wanted to learn and really work out, those guys, a lot of those guys hung out with me. So some of them were coming into New York to help me out and teach the kids' classes and whatnot. And, you know, I remember my teaching initially, because you're young and stupid, right, you, um, you think you know a little bit more. And, you know, I'm teaching, and I'm basically teaching kind of the way I was taught. And as time went on, and I had a, a good following in Manhattan. This is in Manhattan, mind you. Uh, I had a pretty good following, um, you know, and uh, had that following for several years. Um, but then I became a police officer. Once I became a police officer, I, I just couldn't travel back and forth to Manhattan anymore. So then I came back. Um, and, you know, th through the years, you know, especially when I was teaching in my own place, I was already starting to experiment, meaning I was starting to present the material a little bit different and seeing how that was going, okay? And, you know, if something went well, I was like, okay, so this seems to be on the right track. And if I did something else and it didn't seem to go well, I said, mm, okay, I've got, I've got to rethink this, all right? Um, early on, when I started teaching, um, I realized I really love teaching. So it's a big plus for me. So I love martial arts and I love to teach. I love to teach, okay? Um, so that love, I think, comes out. And I'm, I'm pretty strict. I mean, I hold people to a higher standard. I, I don't kid you when I say that. That's why some people can't train with me, all right? They want to come in here and they want it to be like, you know, the typical McDojo where all I tell them is how wonderful they are every class. Oh, my God, you're fantastic. Oh, you know, little Johnny, little Janie. Oh, my God, they're the next Bruce Lee, you know, as they're taking more money out of your pocket, more and more money, right? So my thing is, is I want people that want to train and want to learn and develop a skill, a serious skill. So once I left my first instructor... One of the reasons I left was, is because I kept being told I had to fall in line. I had to do certain things. I had to teach a certain way. I had to do things a certain way. But now I'm not a beginner anymore. I'm there about 10 years, right? And I'm training in other martial arts with other instructors, both Japanese and Westerners. And I'm realizing, well, how come these guys aren't like this guy I'm with in Ishinru Karate? And eventually things came to a head and I left. And um, I had been changing, slowly changing the way we presented the jiu-jitsu curriculum at the other school. But then he was against that. No, 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 it's got to be like this. Meanwhile, this guy, I'd never even seen him do jiu-jitsu. Ten years, never saw him do it. So anyway, now I, I opened my own school and I'm, I tell people right up front, several people from that school came with me. And I said, listen, I'm going to be teaching the way I think it should be taught. So I'm, I'm going with my, my gut and my heart and my brain, and I'm te presenting the material the way I think it should be. So it may seem a little different, and you'd be correct. It's going to be a little different. And I started teaching karate, and I saw people improving quicker. I was like, okay, this is a good sign. All right, so now I figure out more. And then I realized that if I was showing a technique and people were having trouble getting it, I never blamed the students. I always blamed myself. I said, well, I mustn't be presenting the material in the right way where they're getting it. So like I literally, you know, days off from class, I'd be thinking, how can I present that technique in a better way? And then I'd say, okay, let me try this. And then I try that. Oh, look, that works a lot better. They're, they're getting it better. So I was, I was constantly doing that. So I took it upon myself early on that just because I have ability 
and I, I'm a certain degree black belt and I can move a certain way, doesn't mean I can teach other people to do that. And in order to do that, I have to develop a separate and distinct skill set different from the doing it. So teaching it and doing it are two totally separate skills. You know, I'm doing Ishinru Karate and, all, and many of the other arts I do and teach for a long, long time. I've been exposed to top teachers all over the world, Japan, Okinawa, China, the United States, everywhere. Gone all over. Okay. And some I'm like amazed at how they present material. And of course, I steal from them. I steal from them and, and try to use that to help me teach my students. And then other people, I'm amazed that anybody would train with them. And then you'll see a guy who has really good ability, like he's really good. And then you see the students and you're like, mm, what happened here? So obviously he's good at doing it. He's not very good at transmitting it. Again, going back to the idea that if you think being able to do it means you know how to teach it, then you've got a problem right off the bat. So you have to realize that both are two separate skills and both have to be continually developed, all right? Um, about two months into my starting my own place, I wasn't teaching jujitsu, and the students came to me and said, you know, we'd really like to do jujitsu. I said, oh, okay, all right. But I said, if we do jujitsu, I'm going to be teaching it the way I think it should be taught. And they're like, yeah. And... It amazed me that that approach to teaching, which was nothing like miraculous, it wasn't like I came up with some new idea. I did not come up with a new idea. I just literally um, was rediscovering a way to present that material. And then when I eventually when I went to Japan and I trained in Koru in Japan, I realized that my approach had been correct. What I, what I amazingly saw in the dojo was I saw people's jujitsu skill just skyrocket. Like, wow. And you could tell the students were feeling it. They were like psyched. They were hyped up to really come in and train. They could feel themselves getting better every class, like every class. All right. And again, that gave me more confidence then to explore different methods of teaching. Okay. Um, and that's what I started to do. And then I started to, you know, again, bring different elements. I, I started creating some different training drills for Ishinru. I'm not saying I'm the only one that ever created it. I'm not saying I'm the first person in the history of the universe to ever create it. But it was new in my universe. And for the most part, some of the drills I do, I don't see other do dojo doing. And that's okay. I don't care. They're not my responsibility. My students are my responsibility. Um, so again, you say, well... You know, come on, Calandra, how important is this coming up with different methods of training and teaching? Well, I'll give you one example. I'd always heard that you should be able to fight multiple opponents if you know karate, right? You may have to fight more than one guy. But I never see any training geared towards that. So I decided to develop a, a training drill where you're working against multiple opponents. And it simulates how you'd have to do it in combat. Um... So I started doing this training drill and people immediately liked it. They were like, wow, this is really good. And then I added to it, you know, so I'd add different things to it. Um, you know, uh, you know, I tried to make it, you can only make it so realistic without people getting hurt. So after there has to be some rules. So this is what, how we do this drill. All right. So then what happens is, you know, several years ago, and I've told this story in the podcast before, one of my students was attacked by three guys in a store. And he handled them no problem. And he came in the next day and he said to me, I know this is going to sound crazy, Sensei, but it was just like the drill we practiced. I, you know, I grabbed the one guy, I cranked his arm in a joint lock, I threw him into the other guy, and then the third guy was coming at me. I hit him, I dropped him with one punch, and then when I went back to go after the other guy who I'd thrown the first guy into, he was running. And he said, it's exactly the way you teach us in the drill. You say where well, we can grab a guy in a joint lock and use that arm bar to throw him into the other person. You know, because sometimes we do it with three or four attackers, not just two, right? 
So again, validation of a training drill that I'd implemented in the dojo. Okay, and again, my dojo is not about winning tournaments. It's about that time when you're attacked for real, where now it's, it's you have to defend yourself or you're going to get seriously hurt or killed. That's my function, okay? Um, can I teach you to win tournaments? Yeah, I can, but I just think it's all BS, so I don't pay too much attention to it, okay? I've never allowed my students to compete in, in sparring because the sparring that I see karate people doing in their dojo is ridiculous and bears no resemblance to actual combat. Okay, all you need to look at is some of the Motobu Choki drills and look at those sparring drills and you'll realize, wow, those don't look anything like modern sparring where we're putting on these pads and, you know, playing a game of tag with each other and jumping around, right? No, because real fighting is not like that, all right? That's what I'm, I'm focusing on, okay? So, you know, I watch old videos of myself where I'm teaching a seminar and I literally get nauseous when I hear myself, when I see myself, right? And that's a good thing. That means my, the way I present the material, the way I teach has improved. Um, you know, and again, even these podcasts, I watch the first one or two and I, I think I've gotten a little bit better and I'm trying to get better. Every podcast I try, try to improve, right? I try to improve every night my teaching. So every night I try to improve it. I'm never satisfied with how good I teach. I'm always like, mm, I can probably present this in a better way. And I work at it, and I work at it, and I work at it. And I, I think it's paid off. And those that attend seminars with me um, usually really, really enjoy um, the experience. And, you know, I'll give you for instance. You know, so I sit here and I wax poetic, right, about different martial arts topics and different self-defense topics, right? And, you know, I'm teaching out here, right? And I'm doing a lot of Zoom classes. I do upwards of uh, 10 Zoom classes a week, okay? Um, in all the different arts I teach, all right? And I guess from that constant, now I'm really teaching a lot, right? And I'm having present material in the Zoom format is different, right? Um, the last time I went back to New York to do a seminar in New York, several of my most senior people came up to me and say, you know, Sensei, I just want to tell you, the way you're presenting the material this time is just, it's amazing. It, it's like, it's like, wow. And I'm like, yeah. And they were like, yeah. And I said to myself, well, I guess, you know, all this other teaching I'm doing is paying off. Because again, I try to get better on, on the Zoom classes. I try to get better in this. I try to get better in, in any time I present material. And, you know, I've still got a long way to go. And my thing is I'll never stop learning to be a better instructor and a better practitioner. You know, and that, that doesn't mean that I'm not going to slow down a little bit. I mean, we all slow down a little bit as we get older. But as far, far as how I can teach the material, even when I'm older, I should be able to teach you to reach a pretty high level. Um, and, and that brings me to another point. So I'm ninth down in Ishinru Karate. Now, if Master Shimabuku has entrusted me with the belief that he feels I'm ninth down Hanshi, that means he's entrusting me with the belief that I can bring someone up to eighth down. Okay? So, my dojo, a lot of people find it interesting. They come in and they can tell who the senior dons are. And we don't wear stripes on our belt, another Western idea that's ridiculous and people need to throw it out in the garbage because nobody in Japan wears stripes on their belt. Yeah, I know, some styles wear the, the gold embroidered stripes for Renshi, Kyoshi, and Hanshi. Yeah, okay, whatever. I'm talking about the guys that I see putting tape around their black belt. Like they're ninth on and they've got nine, nine pieces of tape because they don't want people you know, to, at a seminar or at a thing they're attending to not know that, well, I'm a ninth on, right? Yeah, it's a huge ego problem. Please stop it because people look at you and think you're an idiot, all right? So, but that means if you're a sixth don in the dojo, well, then you should be able to help the fifth, fourth, third, second, and first dons, and you should be able to help them improve so they can go to their next level. Now, if you're a person who has no interest in teaching, there's nothing wrong with that too. There's guys in my New York school that if I really need them to cover a class, they will by all means, they'll hop in the saddle and they'll cover the class. But they've kind of made it clear to me that, look, I'm not really interested in teaching for whatever reason. There's nothing wrong with that. 
You can have guys. So, so that's another thing that people that run schools should recognize. Don't expect everybody that makes black belt wants to teach. And don't force them to teach. Maybe they don't want to teach. Maybe they're just doing this for themselves and they want to train for themselves. If you're making a requirement, well, they have to teach, I think you're making a big mistake. I, I just don't think that's important. Again, if a guy is like, listen, I come here two nights a week. I just want to train hard and work at this and get good at this, but I really don't have any plans to teach. And sensei, I'm, I'm just not really not interested in teaching. Now, that's not to say I might not ask that guy in a class, you know, if he's a shodan and I have a white belt learning Saison, hey, can you do me a favor? Could you show him the next move of Saison? And I've never had a black belt say no to that, okay? But I'm not asking him to teach all the time. I'm not asking him to cover classes on a regular basis. I've realized that this particular guy doesn't, doesn't really want to teach. He just wants to come down and train. So if you're, if you're having requirements that if you're a black belt, you have to teach, um, you know, I don't know that that's necessarily important. I think you might want to rethink that. You might be losing students because of it, you know. Um, plus, my philosophy, too, is a guy at Shodan may decide he doesn't want to teach. And then a guy who hits third on decides, you know what, Sensei? I think I'd like to start covering some classes. I feel now I kind of feel like I know my stuff. And if it's okay with you, I'd like to start teaching. So what I do then is the ones that want to learn to teach, I train them to be teachers. I teach them the Calandra method of teaching. And then after they've got the Calandra method, I tell them, okay, now you know the Calandra method. Now, if you want to put in some of your method, go right ahead and try it and see how it works. So I'm not expecting them to be a carbon copy of me. I don't want anybody to be a carbon copy of me. I want them to figure out their own way. So I give them my way at first, and it's the same in martial arts. I show them my work, way how to physically do things. Then as they train, maybe they come up with something on their own where they figure out for their body how to do something better. That's what they're supposed to be doing. Okay, This is not me holding their hand their whole life. I'm the guide along the path. It's the same with teaching. I'm the guide along the path. So I'd watch a guy teach. Um, a year and a half, almost two years before I, when I knew I was leaving New York to come out to Arizona, I began not teaching. So I began having the person that took over my school, James Waller. I began him um, teaching, okay? And I um, would watch him and I'd make corrections. I'd say, okay, don't teach that like this. Try it like this and blah, blah, blah. And I, that, that's what I would keep doing. And then what I would do is sometimes I would step off the floor and I'd go in my office and sit there and I'd listen. I'd listen to what he's saying. And then, okay, he's finished, all right. He says, all right, everybody take a break, get a drink, whatever. I come out, I say, all right, this was good. This wasn't so good. Be careful how you do this or say this. And that's what I did for a year and a half to two years. And not just with him, with other black belts too. I had them teaching because I knew I wasn't going to be there. And they did say to me initially that it was a transition because now... If they didn't, weren't sure of something, they couldn't just walk over to me and say, hey, Sensei, could you, you explain this? I'm not sure of it. Now they had to figure it out. And several of them called me and said to me, in a way, he says, obviously, Sensei, we wish you were still here. But in a way, it's forced us to grow up. It's forced us to figure things out on our own. So um, let your students... Take the training wheels off, let them do their thing, and you guide them. They step off the path a little bit, bring them back on the path, okay? But give them some freedom to figure out and experiment with how they teach, all right? And you should do that with their martial arts also. Don't be so rigid in your thinking. You'll find your students will appreciate it, and you'll get a lot more out of them. I hope you enjoyed this one. Um, teaching versus doing, all right? Um, if you like it, please click that like, share, subscribe button. I really appreciate it. It really helps me a lot. Uh, if you want to support the channel, if you look down underneath the video, you'll see there's a line of products. You can order products. There's Ishinru stuff. There's different things. Matayoshi Kobudo, Chen Style Tai Chi. Um, if there's a product you'd like to see me add, please shoot me a message. All right? Consider becoming a member. It's $2.99 a month. Um, we're right around that 100 member mark. Love to hit it. 
We'll start doing some live stuff once we hit that 100 member mark. All right. And I will be in New York January 18th to 21st um, at my old dojo, Station Con East in Floral Park, New York, Long Island, New York. All right. I'll be teaching uh, four days of seminars, Katori Shintoru, Mariyoshi, Kobudo, Sosuishiru Jiu-Jitsu, Ishinru Karate, and Chen style Tai Chi Chuan practical method. So their uh, Sensei Waller's contact info will be in the description so you can reach out for him if you're interested in uh, attending the seminars. All right. Again, appreciate you watching. See you in the next video. Thanks.